Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, reminding you, as always, you can check out NewWorldNextWeek.com for everything you need related to this show that you're watching, episode 191 of the New World Next Week. James, we'll begin with a story we've touched on all throughout the life of New World Next Week, and it's something we want to keep the audience and ourselves up to date with, and that is the constant moving of the goalposts, the constant lying and obfuscation, and folks just asking for a justification. Federal judges order Obama to release memo justifying assassinations of Americans. This coming from the always informative allgov.com. The Obama administration has been ordered by a panel of federal judges to release its legal justification for assassinating Americans suspected of terrorist ties. Critics of the controversial program have sought the legal memo in question since the 2011 killing of Anwar al-Awlaki, a U.S.-born cleric who died in Yemen following a drone strike. The Obama White House has insisted that the government can lawfully assassinate Americans who join up with terrorist organizations. In the case of al-Awlaki, his purported ties to al-Qaeda justified the decision to target the man from New Mexico. But the administration has, had been unwilling to reveal the legal document that formed the basis for killing Alaki and others like him. This refusal prompted the American Civil Liberties Union, the New York Times, and even two of their reporters, Charlie Savage and Scott Shane, to sue the Obama administration to force the memo's release. James, we've seen this push back and push away time and time again. Can this reach the point of them actually producing the justification? More to the point, even if they do, how long will that actually stay in the news cycle? How long will Americans even care about it? And I say that not flippantly. Um, remember, it was, what, nine years ago now that, uh, that John Yoo was, uh, was questioned by Doug Castle if the president deems that he's got to torture somebody, including by crushing the testicles of the person's child, there is no law that can stop him, to which John Yu says, no treaty. And Doug Castle says, also no law by Congress. This is what you wrote in the August 2002 memo. And John Yu said, ah, I think it depends on why the president thinks he needs to do that, which is one of the most disgusting things that has ever been propounded by any sort of legal counsel for the White House imaginable, or any government administration. The idea that that could be justifiable depending on what's necessary. And that as as unbelievable as that exchange is, it's there in not only in black and white, there's actual audio recording of it. You can go and listen to John Yu saying this. And what has resulted from that? Hardly anyone even knows that John Yu ever said that. The few people that do and, and follow him around and continue to protest him, as they should, have largely been sort of drowned out of the debate. I mean, yeah, they've they've followed him around, they've they've protested him at various events. But that's about it. And that's and what did that change about US policy? Well, pretty much nothing. It contributed nothing whatsoever. So even if they come out with the legal counsel that says, yep, president can kill anyone he wants, including Americans, anytime, anywhere, that's the law, because you know, if he deems it necessary, it, it won't be significantly different from the idea of torturing someone's ch children in order to, you know, stop a terrorist attack or whatever ridiculous scenario they come up with. And it, that resulted in nothing. So I'm going to say, yeah, they might come out with it. And I don't think it'll result in anything. Well, and I think even what you're referring to there is in some sort of mythical 24 TV show like terrorist scenario where we've just got to, you know, kill someone's child to get information. J James... John Yu wasn't in my show notes. We didn't talk about this pre-show. And even as you mentioned his name, it came flooding back to me. I had forgotten about John Yu. And that's not you nine years ago? Uh, December 1st, 2005. That's under the other guy. So I, I think your point is well made. The other relateds will include here briefly, as our good friend Brock West notes, life's good if you're a drone-loving criminal regime as U.S. drone strikes continue with impunity in Afghanistan without facing any international action despite Washington's planned withdrawal from the war-stricken country. Meanwhile, in Spain, makers say don't worry about privacy as the civilian drone industry takes off in sunny Spain, that via Global Post. But James, having said that, we'll move to our second story this week, which I think will be the larger one, which perhaps unlike the forgotten drone killers, 
I think this will be the story that folks really, really will be talking about because it'll affect the very way you're hearing us talk about this. FCC finally announces new rules that will kill net neutrality. This from Boing Boing, noting that the Wall Street Journal was the first to report that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, will propose new Internet rules today, that's April 24th, 2014, that will allow content companies to pay Internet service providers for special access to consumers. Under the new rules, service providers may not block or discriminate against specific websites, but they can charge certain sites or services for preferential traffic treatment if the ISP's discrimination is quote-unquote commercially reasonable. Bye-bye, net neutrality and the internet as we know it. Hello, greater connectivity gap between rich and poor in America. Boing Boing helpfully points out, for what it's worth, the FCC's current chairman, Tom Wheeler, previously worked as a venture capitalist and a lobbyist for the aforementioned cable and wireless industry. Even the New York Times writes, the new rules, according to the people briefed on them, will allow a company like Comcast or Verizon to negotiate separately with each content company, Netflix, Amazon, Disney, Google, and charge different companies different amounts for priority service. That, of course, could increase costs for content companies, which would then have an incentive to pass on those costs to consumers as part of their subscription prices. Netflix just announced a couple of days ago they're going to up their streaming rates. Proponents of net neutrality have feared that such a framework would empower large, wealthy companies and prevent small startups, which might otherwise become the next Twitter or Facebook, for example, from getting any traction in the marketplace. James, the other way to look at this is possibly Internet 2 that we've talked about for a long, long time. So even CNN calls it the Internet fast lane. Big companies may soon be able to pay to have their websites load faster. James. Well, it's important to differentiate between what's uh, the internet infrastructure and what the ISPs, the internet service providers, are doing. And this is an ISP uh, policy that they can choose to implement, I guess, under these new guidelines or whatever. I think the underlying principle of this is uh, everyone is for net neutrality except for the big multi-billion dollar corporations and the internet giants that will benefit from being able to pay to get their stuff uh, piped through faster. So the vast majority, 99% of the, the internet population is for net neutrality. So who who should we be relying on to, to enforce that, to make sure that happens? Should it be the FCC that is admittedly and undeniably in bed with these corporations that lobby it to the tune of untold millions of dollars behind the scenes every year to try to get these net neutrality laws stricken down? The principle here is that if you give the government the power to regulate the internet in terms of oh, ISPs have to uh, do these arbitrary things or they can't do these arbitrary things or they can do these things in certain situations, then you've just get ceded the game to these big corporations that own the FCC. How much input do you or I have over what the FCC decides to do or the, you know, the government regulatory agency of any C country that we might happen to be living in, pretty much zero. I mean, we have zero say in this. The corporations have a much bigger say. So should we leave it to the government to decide this? Of course not. What are the alternatives? If in the outcome of this, your ISP says, look, we're, uh, we're going to start giving preferential treatment to Disney because they pay us extra money or whatever it is, Netflix or Google, and you continue to purchase your internet subscription from that ISP, then you are literally paying for this net destruction of net neutrality you are literally giving it giving juice to these uh, big corporations to do what they're doing so the only thing that we can really actually do the only thing we can actually accomplish is vote with our dollars and it always comes back to this we can choose not to get an isp that will violate net neutrality we can choose to support an isp that will support net neutrality if there is no isp that supports net neutrality it does not again mean that we're hopeless helpless people that need the government to come along and and create one. There are alternatives, and we've talked about it. I've talked about it on CorbettReport.com, the solutions episode on pirate internet. We'll link to it in the show notes. There are technological ways that we can get around these systems, because the internet is not 
the ISPs. They're not the same thing. The ISPs can choose to do what they want, but the internet itself, the infrastructure, is uh, is capable of the net neutrality that we all want. So if it doesn't happen, the fault is not in the stars, it's not in the government, it's not in who's, whatever puppets in power, it's in ourselves. We choose what happens, we vote with our dollars, and we either make the technological alternatives or we don't. We cede the game to the corporations. The choice is ours. Well said, my friend. The one related I'll add to this second segment is a story I find really interesting. It's ongoing, and it's something I wanted to note a a few weeks ago. And Ben Swan has covered the story and calls it cronyism at its finest as the U.S. government arguing against Aereo on behalf of broadcasters before the Supreme Court. I'll I'll just give you the brief intro because it's a a big, fascinating story that – as everything we cover on this show, we'll give you the links. You go do more research for yourself. The United States Supreme Court has begun hearing arguments over whether whether or not streaming company Aereo can continue to share broadcast content with customers without paying a fee to those broadcasters. The case is American Broadcasting Companies Incorporated versus Aereo Incorporated, which is funded by Barry Diller, who is no small player in, in the broadcast game anyway. So again, I, I implore you to go check that out as we move, James, to our third and final segment this week. And perhaps we could even call it another segment of, of good news. Hashtag my NYPD attracts photos of police violence and abuse. When the NYPD's Twitter account asked people just a few days ago to tweet photos of their interactions with the New York Police Department and tag them hashtag MyNYPD, the outcome was pretty predictable. People who feel that the NYPD stands for unchecked brutality, mass-scale stop-and-frisk racism, and the violent defense of the ultra-rich combined with the official impunity – flooded the tag with photos of NYPD violence, and we will provide some of those links for you. As uh, Digi Strategist notes on Twitter, the folks behind hashtag MyNYPD are learning the tough lesson right now. And I think we kind of see this with a lot of corporations who think people are just going to line up to sort of kiss their feet and kiss their butts and talk about how much we love their corporate crap. So there are some pretty brutal photos and things that have been tweeted back out using hashtag MyNYPD. But I think, James, it's it's another fascinating case of people kind of turning the tables on these sort of ham-fisted publicity stunts. It certainly is, and I think you're you're exactly right. It's so bizarre that they that they that whoever came up with this thought it would never backfire like this. That would be my first thought if I was in that position in the NYPD. How are people going to actually use this this hashtag? And I mean, it's so obvious that people would would pick up on that. But but at any rate, yeah, it's a good it's a good sign that people are not uh, asleep at the switch, and people will shove this back in their face. But I guess this raises an interesting question. It's a kind of a fun story, but it, it has a serious angle to it. I guess there are the people who say, well, this is the, you know, this is how they're going to collect the information on who's against the NYPD and they can use this as kind of a surveillance tool. And then there's the other people who say, well, you know, screw them and who cares? Um, we're, we're still going to use this uh, against them um, because it's a, the propaganda war. Which side of that line would you come down on? I think something like this, when it blows up so large, I don't know that the amount of retweets and the amount of coverage the story has gotten would give them any would give them any greater insight into folks who don't like them more than they probably yeah. already already have. Yeah. Now, if you extrapolated this out and tried to play it out in other towns and cities, that could turn into a real problem. But in New York City, you have millions and millions and millions and millions of people there right so that's uh, that's no, i think that's a good answer and and i think you're right about that especially i mean yeah in new york it's going to be quite quite a bit different the calculus is going to be different but at any rate yeah i think it, i think it's a beautiful thing and uh and if there are listeners and viewers out there in the new york area who have their own stories to share or pictures or what have you you know and if you feel comfortable sharing it on twitter then then do so um and people around the world if you if if that's uh if that's something that you uh, want to get on on board with but at any rate i think it is it is good to shove the propaganda back in their face and show them that uh, that people aren't going to go along with it so james will begin to wrap this episode up with the notes of of 
if if the hashtag my NYPD story is a positive news story, we'll include some other positive news stories that I think this first one, James, even speaks to what we were just talking about. General Mills reverses legal terms after their after controversy. They basically tried to quietly say, you can never sue us for having anything to do with us, whether it's coupons or prizes or emailing us or anything. We are absolved. People found out about it. They immediately capitulated and changed it back. So other good news stories. Federal judge approves class action case against Ford and IBM for helping South African apartheid. James, you and I were just noting that Barry Satoro is over in your neighborhood meeting with Shinzo Abe and the good news out of there, not an unmitigated good news as we note, but it's unlikely to produce any TPP agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Colorado crime rates down 14.6% since legalizing marijuana. Open source comes to farms with restriction-free seeds. And Vermont poised to enact some of the toughest U.S. GMO labeling laws yet. And even their governor is proud to say that he's the first one to kind of put this on the books. So, James, those are some of our good news stories. I don't know if you want to comment on any of those before we just also mention some of the other stories that folks have submitted, and you can as well, using hashtag New World Next Week. Now, I suppose I'd, I'd love the idea of thinking about how that would somehow be subverted against us, but I think that speaks to the fact, I, I hope we know our audience a little better than the NYPD does, and I think a lot of times when, when, when they use these sort of publicity stunt hashtag schemes, they almost invariably end up blowing up in their face when they're used purely for propaganda purposes. We're asking it to help inform all of us out there. So hashtag neural next week updates, James, from at Futures Calling. Researchers unveil system to start storms and lightning on command. The new controversial light bulb, which is funny three words in and of themselves. Controversial light bulb listens to conversations and tweets what it hears. And a couple of more notes, James, of of fascinating Hashtag New World Next Week stories that there are almost too much to get into right now, so I'll just throw it back to you. Just on that light bulb story, it, 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 people who have read Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon will know that that <laughs> that there was in that story a light bulb that listened to conversations. It was a spy light bulb, and when I read that way back in the day, I thought that was the craziest thing I had ever seen written it was just so such a bizarre concept and it is actually here now uh it's just mind-blowing just mind-blowing that i i did not know that and i think that's that maybe sheds light on why this was done because i know i even had some reactions on twitter saying yeah and the freaks who made this have the gall to call themselves artists so in a way, it kind of is an, an art. <laughs> we'll just have to kind of keep shining a light on it, James. And so we, w so we shall. All right. Well, I hope people are staying tuned to Media Monarchy and all the feeds coming out from your various ventures there for all of this latest news throughout the week. And of course, as always, use hashtag New World next week to uh, keep us all up to date on what's happening around the world. And we'll do our best to get to as much of it as we can. And on that note, we'll take it. Uh, we'll leave it there. So thank you again for another week of in interesting stories. Thanks so much, man. Take care.